Hello there, my beautiful and lovely gamers. My name is Jones. Today we're talking about how to become a coach in Overwatch, even if you just dabble a little bit in coaching and want to take it a little bit more serious, or if you're brand new, you want to see what coaching is and how to become a coach. This is hopefully a video for you. We're going to talk about two things. One, my, how I became a coach, how I came from becoming, you know, a really you know, platinum player, no previous competitive gaming experience, never played CS, never played TF2, never played League or anything like that. Really played some Battlefield FPS. How I became, you know, came from that to becoming a professional private coach and coaching some really amazing teams here in EU and so on. Now, that's really what we're going to talk about today. And then we all, the second part is going to be my tips to you guys, how you guys should um become coaches or how you guys can easily or become coaches improve your game sense and so on and some stuff and some rules to kind of help you guys along the way so that's really what i'm going to talk about today so no further ado let's really just begin how do i become a coach it's quite simple sorry in between season one and season like two somewhere around there i decided that you know I want to try to experience this team in, in a totally different way. I want to try team compositions and strategies and tactics. And I love that. And I definitely started that team because it was not something I can get from casual play or even, you know, competitive. Nothing I could get out of there. So I decided to make a team. At the time, again, in Season 2, I placed in Platinum. So I believe that the team was like gold to diamond players somewhere around there. And, well, that's really what we did. We sat down and we started playing and practicing and so on. And remember, at the time, because, you know, it was a new game, no one really had any game experience. No one knew anything about the game, especially in our group. And even, in, you know, the higher competitive team groups, you know, st stuff was still being found out at that time, right? What was meta team composition, what was good to play and so on. And therefore, also because of the lack of resources, I did a couple of things. I read Reddit, I read the forums, I watched YouTube, and then I uh, argued and talked with myself. My very first kind of thing that I want to say is a couple of things. One, if you want to make money of this, you know, if you want to be a private coach, you want to make money and so on. Oh, you know, right? Super dope, right? Um, you shouldn't <laughs> pursue being a private coach. The same that you should not pursue being a YouTuber or Twitch streamer or a professional player. It's not something that makes you a lot of money, especially in the beginning. It took me over one and a half year before I actually got paid anything. And even then, it was like a very not that much. I mean, it was like 20 euros I got paid my very first time, right? And... So it's not really something that makes you a lot of money, especially in the beginning. And even, you know, after you do it a long time, yeah, sure, then you can start making some, you know, some decent money out of it. But it's just not worth it to try to pursue this as like an economic, for the economic in incentive, right? And the second thing I want to tell everyone that want to become a coach, like if you turn off the radio right now, then this you have this, is this. If you want to become a coach, you got to understand that everything in the game has a pro and a con. Everything has an up and side down. Every hero pick, every you know, all the play styles, strategies, tactics, all of that has like strengths and weaknesses to them. And sometimes in what we call meta, it's a lot of time where the the strengths heavily outweigh the weaknesses, right? And then there might be, you know, a team composition that counters that, but that might be a very niche team composition or a very specific team composition, right? So, for example, goats have a shit ton of upside, strong old, strong old economy, strong old usage that synergizes incredibly well. They can build and you can snowball heavily, but ultimate very strong team composition can beat practically anyone because it it breaks the fundamental of Overwatch where you have such a strong front line that it's impossible to stop goats. If your front line isn't goats as well, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible. The only way to do it is to either weaken goats as they engage or play around goats constantly which is difficult because again let's say that you're defending on Volskaya and they play and you're playing goats on defense right and they are playing no you're playing like quad dps on defense and they're playing goats on attack they can theoretically just go on the objective and start capping it right and yes then it's your job to to outplay that and do a lot of damage and get kills and you know demolish the goats before they actually make it to the objective or, dem or make them so weak that you demolish them when they hit the objective right but that's very difficult and i can't be or at least i can be very difficult to do and that's why it's uh, it, that's why it's a challenge to play against goats, right? And that's why that's kind of meta. But goats has its strengths and weaknesses. They have, for example, absolutely no fucking reach. There's no real range damage coming out of goats or anything like that, right? And that's a big issue, right? There's also a team composition that lack, you know, form of high ground control, right? They they are very like based around playing together, playing stacked, and that allows us that allows some weaknesses onto the team composition. Now. Understanding that is very important because that does that. If you, I hate it when people say stuff like, "Oh yeah, this hero is busted," or "This hero broken," and they don't, they can't argue for why. They just think it's broken, or this team composition is broken, and they can't argue for why. They just 
it's just broken. They heard like a YouTuber say it or like they heard it on the forum or whatever. That, oh, it's broken. And therefore it's broken. Therefore we gotta play it. We have to play it. And not understanding that, you know, okay, but we can play other stuff. And there's, you know, there's there's other stuff that, that helps. Even during Mercy meta, you know, you could play Ana instead of Mercy. You, you know, by doing that, you got a lot of utility. You got anti nade, you got nano, you got sleep dots, you got some damage. You got theoretically better heals and like longer range shields and so on. Which is... You know, essentially you get a lot, all these buffs and debuffs, but you don't have res. And at that point, res just outweighed the Ana play so much that, like, the Ana had to do, like, insane shit every single time to, like, be valuable. And then we talk about consistency, that that is not consistent. And therefore, we pick Mercy over Ana all the time, but that did not mean that Ana play wasn't, you know, that, that Ana was just trash. It was just that Mercy was so much better at that time, Right? And that, in my opinion, as always, is very important to remember. Now, if you, for me, as my very first scene composition that I ever played, I'll just kind of bring you, because again, you, you're sitting here and you're probably struggling with the fact that how do I get game sense, right? There's so much in the game to learn. Uh, how do I learn it? Where do I Google? Why do, what, what should I do? I would say that, again, understanding that everything has a pro and a con and talking to yourself about it. And if you see something, trying to reason it for yourself, trying to come up with like a logical reasoning behind it. Why do we play this? Here's the logical reasons, right? Um, what is the strength of this? What is the weakness of this? Why is this pro player in that position? What does he gain? What does he not gain? Uh, why did they burn ultimates here? Why are they positioned like that? Why are they pushing like this, right? And, and kind of like putting logical reasoning behind it that, okay, this is what they get from that. And this is their downside, right? And then you can, to a certain extent, uh, start learning the game. But besides that, it's really a sound the foundation. So again, for someone that had no game sense whatsoever in this game, how did I get into it? How did I get my game sense where it is? And it started with my very first team composition that I ever requested my team to play, that I at least can remember, was Ryan Saria, McCree, Genji, Lucio, Senyara. And here was the reasoning. I'd seen someone else play it, so I had like a foundation of what they wanted to play. And then I knew some stuff about that. The Zenyatta was the pick because of this was 50% back then, so it was really busted, and Trans was really good at stopping us from getting team wiped. Lucio had speed boost because I knew that with Zen we had less healing, so we needed a speed boost, so we could like close the gap to the enemy team, uh, so we could run away from the enemy team, we could disengage, we could engage, right? And so on, we could turn and rotate and so on, even though I didn't know much about rotation back then or what a rotation was, but we could essentially go to the objective really fast and like run around the enemy team if needed, if we had the speed. And we had sound barrier, which allows us again to keep our people up during ultimates, which was really good because we then we couldn't wipe easily. We picked a Rhine because a Rhine had a big shield, and it was like, yeah, with a big shield, then we can like block damage and we can shoot through it ourselves, and it's really good for trading. And if we don't, then they can really just like stand behind their shield and trade with us without us being able to do that. And you know, at that time, I didn't think that there was any other alternatives. Like, oh, we could just play around that. No, no, no. In my head, that was like the only option to do. You know, if they were going to trade with their Ryan ship, we have we need a Ryan ship ourselves. And Ryan does a lot of damage. So if we run our Reinhardt into their Reinhardt, we can do a lot of damage. If they don't have a Reinhardt, we can run our Reinhardt into their other tanks. And he can like just smack him around. And that can be like an insane amount of damage I put for our Ryan. And we can like stabilize behind our shield constantly, which is really good. So if they don't play around, we are at advantage. And if both of us play Ryan, then it's really an outplay ability. And Earth Shadow is broken because we can Earth Shadow and just, you know, that's a free team wipe if it lands big. Saria was picked because of damage. We need a tank that stands up with a Reinhardt so that the Reinhardt can't just get pushed back alone. If their Reinhardt tries to hit our Reinhardt, our Saria will shoot him with 100 energy. They didn't think about bubble management back then. It was like the bubble was just like, yeah, she has bubble. That's fine, I suppose. Right? The whole idea was still that, okay, we I can... Sorry, I beam you. We have bubbles, and that's fine. Builds energy, and Graviton is pretty broken. Genji was picked for Dragon Blade, and because he could kill Secure, like through shield and so on, didn't think about high ground control, didn't think about Mac pressure at the time. Just Dragon Blade is broken, it builds super fast, and so on. And McCree is there for damage, he has stuns, we can speed push the high noon, right? We have some range damage, and he can do like a lot of damage and help us get picked with the Genji and so on, right? That was my reasoning. And then you played. Then you played, I scrimmed, I played, of course, for my team, and I. I always think that it's really good for the coaches to play for a team before they become coaches because that way you can put yourself in the shoes of the players. That's not something that you have to do. It's just my recommendation probably because I did that myself, so I would recommend other people to do it, but it's not a must. But anyway, then you play with it and then you kind of notice certain stuff. For example, we noticed that our Ryan was constantly losing that frontline battle. So then it's like, why? And then we noticed that the other players, as their Ryan went to hit our Reinhardt, they bubbled their Ryan, so we couldn't deal damage to him. And we had already burned bubble while we engaged to build energy. 
because we only use bubble to build energy on the Saria, right? Because again, we didn't think about bubble management. And then it's like, oh, and then they trade a lot of damage, and now our Reinhardt is at low health, so if he swings his hammer, he dies. So he needs to keep his shield up, and if he keeps his shield up, they can just constantly bully him and push us back. And when we are pushed back, what does that mean? That means that we lose space. Oh, that's what space is. And then that snowballs. Then we talk about, okay, how can we take their space away from them? What happens if we do correct bubble management? How should we play that? Um, if we get pushed super far back and we get pushed super hard back, you know, okay, how can we, you know, recontest that? Um, how can we make sure that they lose a lot of space, right? Okay, if we take out the Rhine, that's a really good way. So if we can focus by the Rhine, that's really good. Maybe we can use the Lucio to push the Rhine out, to, out, of, out of the way. Maybe we can uh, push him out of the way, shatter behind the Rhine. Maybe we can stun over the Rhine, shatter his team behind him, right? Because the Rhine is nothing but his team. So a way to also kill the Rhine is not just to kill him, but if we can sabotage his team, then the Rhine is useless because he's nothing without his team, right? And then that kind of just snowballs and that builds. And again, if you want to become a coach, Find a team, um, someone that's probably around your ELO, whatever. Find a team, find maybe a couple of teams. Maybe you can't dedicate yourself to one. Find a bunch of teams, maybe find a lot of players. Do VOD reviews for the players, do it for free. Do it to educate yourself and so on. And I always say do voice chat is much better. You kind of watch the VOD, you take notes, you know, at 4.30, the guy's out of position, he dies because. And again, if you reason yourself to every single argument, why did we die? why did the uh, why didn't we have trans why okay we lost that 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 fight because the dragon blade does we okay you're reviewing a Sinyata player why didn't he have trans okay he's so far back that he's not doing any damage he's not being active so he couldn't build trans great that might be the reason positioning you too far back right but if he's too far forward he might die so we need to find a, a different position right um, okay, maybe that wasn't the case. Maybe we used trans to fight before. Okay, was that a waste? Let's just say that no, it wasn't a waste. Like, if we hadn't used trans there, we would have lost that team fight. Okay, but then we should have known that next fight they're gonna use blade. How should we play against that? Well, for example, we had grab, we had shatter. Just to this is again, just an example. Okay, if we had grabbed super early, then they wouldn't play, right? We would grab, we win that fight super early. Next fight, we shatter super early, so they can't use blade. Now we want two team fights extra with our ultimates, and we have had time to build up Sound Barrier. They go on the blade, we have Sound Barrier, and we and we can survive the blade with the Sound Barrier, win the third team fight. next team fight, we have Trans. Then we can Trans next team fight to make sure we win that one, that's four team fights won, and they use their blade. Even though we out of sync with our Trans, that's the way to do it. For example, right, just to give like a very brief example. And then you work with that, right? Why did we lose here? Why did you die here, right? And that can be everything. Why did you die here? Oh, I didn't have nade. Why didn't you have nade? Was it a waste? Should you have known about this? Was that a wasted nade? Was it not a wasted nade, right? Um, why did you die there, Skenji? Okay, yeah, I didn't have dash to escape. Why didn't you have dash to escape, right? Uh, or I was super, super low. Okay, when did you trade badly as a Reinhardt? So on, so on, so on, right? All of this adds up. And that's kind of how you improve. It's really, you need to coach, 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 and coach. you got to Play the game yourself. You've got to get to a high skill level so you can kind of play in the higher so you can kind of put yourself in the shoes. That's also why I say scrimming is really good because then you can put yourself in the shoes of the players you're educating and then you need to take up individual players. I had a small group of like masses GM players that I was um, talking to, like a, a group of them that I was coaching outside of my team individually that I just like coached for myself, didn't really talk much about it. Then I coached a couple of teams just for fun while I was dealing with my team. I coached a couple of teams on the side just for fun. Sometimes I swapped them out, sometimes I didn't. I came to their team practice and so on. And then at the same time, I had a lot to do with my own team, right? A lot to do with my own individual players, my own individual team and so on. And remember, you are a coach. Your job is to, yes, you need a lot of game sense to be a good coach. You, because again, if you can't explain what's good and bad and if you don't know about the game then your coach can't teach anyone but in the end you are a teacher your job is to take your game sense and tell other people and if you can't do that as a coach you're a horrible coach you need to be able to educate people that's why i always said that even though you know a lot about the game if you can't explain it and if you can't give you know people the information that they need to get better to improve to stop doing mistakes to start playing it right if you can't help them doing that, not just like in one situation saying, oh yeah, in this situation you died because of blah, 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 blah. If you can't find like underlying mistakes, if you can't find like general place on mistakes and general misunderstandings and kind of teach them that, then it doesn't really matter. If you teach them how to play Nepal, shrine, like right, 
right? And oh, now you can play in Nepal Shrine, right? Okay, great. There's just like all the other maps left that, he needs, that you now need to tease him individually, right? Um, then you are not a good coach. So being a coach, again, in the end is, yes, you need game sense. You need to build game sense, as I talked about. But you also need to find a way to explain the game sense to other people. And I think that's the best thing about a coach. And the best way to improve as a coach is to sit down and talk to yourself or to talk to someone and explain something as if they know nothing about the game. Where you start. Just take space, for example. I want everyone to do this right now. Take space. Talk to yourself or write in the comment section about space. From the beginning, what is space? How do we use it? All the way up to advanced. All the way up to the most advanced stuff that you can do about space. Right? And cover that entire topic of space. Right? This will hopefully give you something to and question yourself when you speak about stuff, right? And doing this with another player, for example, someone that doesn't know anything about space, will do that he can ask questions, which will put you at a difficult spot because all of a sudden you need to explain something that maybe you know, but it's difficult for you to, like for you it's logical, but you need to explain somehow, right? And that helps you a lot to both increase your game sense and become a better coach. So yeah, that's my uh, guide to how to become a coach. Start with a team, start playing, start thinking about the game. Everything has a pro and a con and so on and start setting up a small group and so on and then start working and you will slowly but surely get better and better at game understand more and more about the game and then become a much better coach so that's really all for it today liking and subscribing bell notification is really amazing tell me down in the comment section what you think do you have a tip that really helped you as a coach or do you have any questions for either me or the community you can tell them down in the comment section my twitter my twitch or our discord community server all of that link down in the description as always and well guys you know the thing if you want to hire me as your private coach doesn't matter if you're bronze top 100 doesn't matter if you play for a team or not it's 50 euros for a two hour session hit me up on our discord server and i can as long as you can get a bar to me i can help you improve rank up and get better at the game and as always guys my name is Pinturno. you guys please take care of yourselves stay positive i love you guys very very much and keep the enemy in your crosshair